so we started this series called Legacy a couple weeks ago, and we're talking about our faith, our family, and our future. We're talking about what could God do in our lives, and we've been talking about the fact that whether we realize it or not, every decision that we're making, every choice that we're doing every single day is creating a future. In other words, it is creating a legacy. It's not if you're going to have a legacy, it's what is your legacy going to be, and it's either going to be good or it's going to be bad, and it's important for us to live with intentionality, to realize and recognize that every choice we're making is creating something in our future. It's creating how we're going to be remembered. And we looked at a, we've been looking at a verse out of Isaiah chapter 54, and it's been kind of the key verse for this entire series. And this verse has a premise. It has something for every single one of us to do in life. And then God gives us a promise with that premise. And so in Isaiah chapter 54, starting in verse 2, it says, enlarge the side of your tent to make room for more children. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings, do not spare them. Lengthen your tent ropes and make your pegs, stakes firm in the ground. In other words, what God is saying, he's saying, listen, if you want to create a legacy in your life, what you need to do right here, right now in this moment is you need to begin to stretch yourself. You need to begin to expand yourself. You need to be able to get to this place where you're uncomfortable being comfortable in life. Like where you're currently at is not going to take you to where I want to take you to go. And so you're going to have to force yourself and you're going to have to make a decision that I'm going to be begin to stretch and expand and grow and enlarge my capabilities and possibilities. And as we do that, what will happen is I believe we open up ourselves to realize and recognizing the purpose of our life. When we go, God, I'm, I will do whatever it takes to continue to grow and expand. God goes, man, I can start to reveal some things to you that will allow you to take you to the next level. He says, after we do that, what will happen is, is, here's the promise. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. And your descendants will take possession of the nations and will inhabit deserted cities. Here's what he says. He says, when you begin to stretch, when you begin to expand, what I promise I will do is your life will, con will continue to grow. Your influence will grow. Your capacity will grow. You're going to expand larger and further in every direction. Your scope and your scale is going to enlarge. Not only is your scope and scale going to enlarge, but here's what's going to happen. The generation that's coming after you will take possession of some things in their life because of what you did in this life. Like what you're doing right now is going to be passed on and they're going to possess some things that you don't currently possess because of the decisions that you're making right now. And it's not just about the next generation, but it says your descendants will inhabit deserted cities. It's about generations to come that they're going to occupy and have some things in their life. There are going to be some things that are residing within them that are because of choices and decisions that you made right now that are going to be passed on for generations to come. And what God is wanting us to realize and recognize is that there is a greater purpose that in our life than just existing on this planet. Like your goal in life is not to suck wind and die. That should be inspiring to some of you because that's how you feel right now. I'm just sucking wind and I'm going to die here eventually. God is saying, man, there is something so much more for you. And if you'll recognize and realize that, you'll see that there is a purpose to your life. In fact, the two most important moments in your life are the moment you're born and the moment you realize why you were born. And it's so critical for us, for us to realize and recognize why we are on this planet. Because if we don't discover that, we're going to walk around this life unfulfilled and purposeless. And God's saying, man, you need to discover why you're here. Because when you discover why you're here and what you're here for, you'll realize that it's not just about you, but it's about making a, gen a difference for generations to come. And, and I'll be honest with you, this week as I was, I was getting ready for this weekend, I had three messages I wanted to preach. And I didn't figure anybody wanted to sit through three messages this weekend. And so I, I was like, God, what do you, what do you want me to say? Because I kind of want to say this. Uh, I feel an urge over here to talk about this. And, and so I was struggling all week. And finally on Thursday, like God just kind of spoke to me. It's like, hey, here's, here's how I want you to do this. And uh, part of what I want to do, and God said, hey, here's what I want you to take out of that 
is out of Psalms 112, verses 5 and 6. And I think it's an important thing for us to, to see here today. It's going to kind of set the stage for what God wants to say. And it says this. It says, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. He says, in other words, he goes, man, you want to you wanna live this incredible legacy life? It's going to come by, based on what you give in life. And it's not just about what you give, but it also says who conducts their affairs with justice. It's not just about how you give, but it's how you live. And if you'll get the understanding that your life is about how you give and how you live, what it says is it says, surely the righteous, a person who is generous, lends and conducts their affairs with justice, a, 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 a person that is righteous is in right standing with God. That's what righteous means. You're in right standing with God. We'll never be shaken. In other words, God is giving us a formula for how in life we can never be shaken. Some of you are like, God isn't formulatic, it doesn't make formulas. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is what that says. Now notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that the world around you is not going to shake. Because the world around us is shaking continuously. But what God is saying is when you live a certain way, while the world around you will be shaken, you yourself will not be shaken. The world will shake and tremble all around you, but you will be firm because you're standing on a firm footing because you're living in such a way. Listen, if you don't define what your life is going to be all about, you know what will? Your problems. And for some of you, for a long time, your problems have been defining your life. And if you don't realize and recognize why you're on this planet, I'm going to tell you your problems will start to define everything. And they will not take you to a good place. They will actually take you to a very bad place. They will begin to define you, and eventually they will destroy you. But God says, man, a righteous person will never be shaken. It says they will be remembered forever. In other words, when you live this way, you are going to create a legacy. And what is a legacy? We've defined it like this. Legacy is where my life lives on. See, what I know is that everybody in this world wants to make a difference. Very few people want to live differently to make a difference. See, this world will tell you that if you want to build a life, what you got to do is you got to make it about me, myself, and I. And God says the exact opposite thing. It's not about you. It's about how you're going to live this life and how you're going to give and how you're going to live. And so living a legacy where your life lives on means that you have got to give to something that will outlive you. You've got to give to a church, an organization, a cause, something that will outlive you. And when I say giving, I'm not just talking about money because that's not the only part, but it is a part. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your talent. I'm talking about your gifts. I'm talking about your skills. I'm talking about your influence. I'm talking about all those things because you have stuff to give and you need to give it in such a way where it lives on, where it's not all consumed, but where it eventually ends up in heaven when you get there. That is the goal of life. You've got to give to something that will outlive you. But it says, and conducts their affairs with justice. So it's also about living my life so that it outlives me. That's really what this series has been all about. You've got to live your life so that it outlives you. And if you will trust me on this, this will solve your problems. Not like your problems will go away, but all of a sudden you will have something bigger in your life than your problems. Because if the thing in your life that is the biggest in your life is your problems, it will always be a, a, a dead end for you. But when you have something bigger than your problems, then it's just a stumbling block. And when you have something that's bigger than your problems, your, 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 your life becomes a lot more significant. Because you're living for something that is bigger than what you're facing here today. And my goal today is to help you see where does it come from where you live for something bigger than your problems? Where, how do you get at the core this ability to, to give to stuff that outlives you and to live for things that will outlive you? And I think that there's a great story in Mark chapter 14. Uh, it's a story that every gospel writer recorded. In fact, it's a story about a woman who has an encounter with Jesus about 48 hours about before his death uh, on the cross. And it is a significant story. It's that right before Jesus is about to be rejected and betrayed and hung on the cross. This is what it says in Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 1. It says, it was now two days before the Passover and festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and teachers of the religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus and secretly kill him. 
but not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. So, so the, the, the religious people today are scheming and conniving about how are we going to capture Jesus? How are we, how we going to overrule this or overthrow this God that is gaining popularity that people seem to be flocking to? What are we going to do? And they're, they're coming up with a scheme to kill him, but they realize that if we do it in the wrong way, then the people, instead of uh, uh, being with us, they're going to be against us. And so we got to do this in the right way. It says, meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had been previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. And so here comes this woman with this expensive perfume. Uh, The scholars say that this is one of the most... uh, expensive gifts that a woman could bring to the table. In fact, a lot of scholars say that this this would have been worth, uh, you know, about a year's wages. That's an expensive bottle of perfume. And it says it's the essence of nard. Now, I don't know about you, but the essence of nard does not sound like it smells very good to me. Anybody else with me on that? Like, does anybody else, anybody ever smelled the essence of nard? Nobody. Okay, because it was apparently it smelled good back then. It smells terrible to us today. Um, I don't really know what that is, but but they say that, that scholars believe that very few families would have actually had something of this value. And if they did have something of this value, it would have been saved for like this really, really special occasion. And so this woman brings this gift to Jesus. And it says, she broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. How many of you know that we got to be careful in life who we criticize? Because you never know what's going on in somebody else's life. I know, I know for me, it, it, there's been seasons in my life where I've been critical. And I'll, I'll, start, I'll begin to criticize somebody and then I'll hear their story. And I'll go, oh, man, I was an idiot in that moment. Because once I knew the story, I knew that my criticism was unfounded in where I was at. And I, 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 in those moments, I realized I wish I didn't say that. I wish I didn't go to that, that place. And we live in a day and an age where people are extremely critical. Can we all agree on that? Anybody ever experienced some criticism today? Uh, three people in the back. Okay. So maybe you guys are all the critics. Because critics typically... Just saying, if you've never experienced it, because this is what I've found, people that are doing nothing have a tendency to criticize those that are. Woo, yeah. it's getting hot in here. Because if you've never experienced some criticism, that must mean you're doing nothing. Just saying. So Jesus stops them and it says in verse 6, but Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want. So Jesus, Jesus just shuts them down. And, 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 and this is interesting because, you know, they're like, man, you could have done this. Like, you could take care of the poor. And Jesus goes, man, there's poor people everywhere, and I don't see y'all doing anything. That's, in essence, what he's saying to everybody around the table at this point. He's saying, like, listen, it's really easy for you to go, well, you should have done this. He's going, well, what are you doing? Jesus kind of like shuts them down in that moment. He says, you always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. He's telling them, listen, I know you guys think that I'm here to establish this kingdom that's going to overthrow the Romans, but that's not the kind of kingdom I'm establishing. I'm establishing a spiritual kingdom, and what you need to understand is that my time is coming to an end, and you don't even see it yet. And he goes, you will not always have me here. In verse 8, it says, she has done what she could. I think you ought to underline that, circle it, put some stars next to it. This is a key verse because God will only ask you to do what you can do. He won't ask you to do what somebody else is supposed to do. He won't ask you to do something you can't do. He will ask you to do something, and he will only ask you to do something that you can do. He will never put anything on you that you can't do. And and I know our excuse is, well, I don't have that. Well, God isn't asking you to do that. He's asking you to do what you can do. 
She did what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, Jesus says, before the cross, before the resurrection, before the church, before the apostles, before any of that, he goes, hey, listen, my story is going to be told all throughout the world. The gospel is going to be preached, and here's what's going to happen. This woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. So check this out. In the middle, right at the end of his life, Jesus stops everybody and goes, hey, pay attention. This is an important moment. What this woman has done, how she has lived and how she has given is going to be remembered forever. In other words, here's her legacy. And 2,000 plus years later, we are still talking about how she lived and how she gave. What an amazing story. Now, scholars believe and they say that the question that was happening around the table at this point was this question. Well, Jesus, how much is too much? It's like, that's a pretty, that's a natural question. I mean, like this, this woman did something crazy. Like how much is too much? And that's a good question. Like how much, God, how much is too much? Like what do you, what do you require? But I, and while that's a good question, that's not the right question. Because we always want to talk about what and we don't want to talk about why. But the why is always going to determine the what. And the better question is, is what, why did this woman do this? This is what she did, but why? What, what was it that was happening inside of her that caused her to move in such a way? And I think it comes down to two words, and they're beautiful words. It's this, she had extravagant love. Extravagant love. She was loved extravagantly by God. The Bible says this is one of two women. They don't know because it's not conclusive. It was either a, a woman named Mary who was a prostitute who Jesus had forgiven and set free and spoken life into her. Or it was this woman that was demon possessed that had, been, had the demons cast out of her. So this woman had been loved extravagantly in a world that had never loved her. And therefore, because she had been loved extravagantly, her natural response was to love extravagantly. You know why I think that those are great words? It's because that's the same kind of love that God has towards you and me. It's an extravagant love. I mean, God has been so extravagant in his love towards us. When we were unlovable, you know what? God still loved us. When we were screwing up, God still loved us. When we were making all kinds of mistakes, God still loved us. When, when I know it, and it's hard to believe that some of us did some things wrong, God still loved us. And when some of us who don't think we've ever done anything wrong, God still loved us. Why? Because God loved us while we were yet sinners. God looked down from heaven and said, man, my extravagant love is so great that I'm going to give them the most precious gift I have my son to go down, live a perfect life, and die a sinner's death on a cross. Why? Because God wants them to know he loves people extravagantly. I mean, that's, that's why we're here right on university where people will drive by us all day long is because there is a God in this world that wants people that are thinking they've got it all going on and they've got everything in the world, but yet their soul is empty to know that there is something out there that will fill the void in their soul. And the only thing that's going to fill the void there in their soul is the extravagant love of the creator who created them that wants to deposit that love into their life through his church. He's just waiting for some people that will go, man, I've been loved extravagantly, therefore I'm going to love others extravagantly. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that every man, woman, and child has an opportunity to experience that kind of love. Some of you are like, you need to calm down. No, 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 you need to get fired up. See, that's the problem. I'm fired up because I've been loved extravagantly. When you experience extravagant love, you get passionate. When you haven't, you're kind of laid back. And I think the problem in church is we have an idea about God, but we have not experienced the love of God. Because when we have, it changes us. It transforms us. It shapes everything that we do. It makes us want to live different and give different because we've been loved different. 
When I think about extravagant love, I, I think about my relationship with Shayla. And we've, this next year, we're going to be married for 20 years. But I remember when we were dating. I know, it's crazy. We got married at 12. It's awesome. Uh, I remember when we were dating and, and she worked at this optometrist's office and, and I would show up to that, her job with flowers and, and cards and, and I would drop them off and I would leave and I would, I would go and I'd buy candy and put it under her windshield so that when she walked out, she would see something else to show her. I loved her. I would write her poems. I would climb the highest mountains. I'll swim the deepest. I would do anything for her love. Why? Because I wanted to express to her the, how extravagant my love was for her. I wanted her to experience everything that I felt about her. And I still do. I'm still, to this day, I'm, I'm like, babe, what, what do I need to do to show you love? You need push-ups? I'm your man. Boom, boom, boom. I'll do whatever. I'll do burpees. Whatever you need, I will show it in whatever form or fashion. you never seen a pastor do a burpee before, did you? can do one or two. That's about it. And then I'm out of breath, so. <laughs> but I want to express that. I, and I want to express that so that she realizes it. And what do you hope when you do that? It gets reciprocated. What's God's hope for us is that we would reciprocate his extravagant love back towards him. And I think about this woman. That's exactly what she does. She... She gets to this place where she's like, man, I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to love my Savior extravagantly. And my prayer is, is that we would get a hold of extravagant love because extravagant love is going to change our life. Extravagant love is what our, our, our church needs. Extravagant love is what our nation needs more than anything. And extravagant love is not expressed in casual commitment. Extravagant love is expressed in full-on commitment. And so I want to talk to us today because I think the heart of us living and giving differently comes from a place of extravagant love. Well, we've been loved extravagantly, therefore we want to love God back extravagantly, therefore we worship extravagantly. And so I want to talk to you about three things extravagant love does. Number one, extravagant love does not see how much it can get away with. Extravagant love does not see how much you can get away with. Listen, you will never have a great marriage seeing how little you can get away with. You're never going to raise the children that will follow after God if you're saying to yourself, I wonder how little bit of time I can spend with my kids. You'll never build that business or that career going, I wonder how little I can give to this opportunity. You'll never beat that addiction going, I, I wonder how little I'll have to work hard to accomplish this. Aren't you glad that there wasn't a God in heaven that looked down and goes, I wonder how little I have to give to them. I wonder how little I have to love them. No, no, no. God goes, man, I'm going to go all in. I'm not going to do what I can only get away with. I'm going to give everything away. That's why this story is so critical. This woman gives this incredible, valuable sacrifice that is Beyond comprehension to everyone around her. It's a profound offering at the time. She loved him without regard to cost, to price, or personal pride. you got to understand that for a woman in that day, to go and break something and put it on a man and touch a man's head was a cultural no-no. Like, you, you, you want your life to end. There it is. It's over. And this woman goes, man, I'm going to break the mold. I'm going to break the lid. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to break every single boundary, and I'm going to go for it. So let me ask you a question. Do you ever do this for God yourself? Do you ever love him extravagantly where you break the mold, you break the boundary, where you take the lid off the ceiling that you've been living under for the last Month, week, year, decade. I remember quite a few years ago, Shayla and I, it was at Christmas time, and we heard about this single dad of three kids that didn't have any money for Christmas, and we felt like God was speaking to us of how much he had blessed us in life, that we were to go and provide this family Christmas. And 
we did what any logical person would do. We set out with a budget. Uh, like we're going to spend like $200 and go buy some gifts and give them to this family. And we thought, oh, that's, that's good. And we, I remember we went to Target and we were going down the toy aisle. And, and I realized the price of Legos for the first time. Like Legos <laughs> by themselves cost $200. It's like, it's like the gift that causes a lot of pain in your life. It causes financial pain and it causes physical pain when you step on it later. It's like the gift that, that it always is, is taking from you as a parent. And, and I was like, man, that's, that's like one Lego for one kid is not going to solve it. And, and it was in that moment that I felt like, man, God was like, man, don't see what you can get away with. Like you're coming in here seeing what you can give away with. You need to be extravagant. And we went crazy. For the next, like, hour, we just went crazy. They had some girls. There was a little boy. We are, we are loading up carts. We are buying all this. We spent so much money on this family. I remember we went home. We wrapped all these gifts and put it for the kids. We called the dad up and said, hey, we're coming over to drop off gifts for you to give to your kids because we want you to still have dignity with them. And so we don't want them to see that it's us giving you gifts, but it's you giving them gifts. Why? Because extravagant love doesn't see what it can get away with. It goes, hey, I want God's love to be shown through my life. Number two, extravagant love sees things that others don't see. Extravagant love sees things that others don't see. Have you ever noticed that it, where the, you'll, you'll see two people, you'll see a, a guy and a girl, and one of them is beautiful and one of them is ugly, and you're like, I don't, I don't see what they see. Like, I, how does that relationship work? Anybody, anybody, like, I remember growing up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date myself here. Uh, there was a woman named Julia Roberts. She played Pretty Woman. Like, at the time, was probably the most beautiful person on the planet. And, and, and she got married to a guy named Lyle Lovett. And, and, and he was a country singer. And Lyle Lovett happened to probably be the most ugliest man on the planet. If Time Magazine would have had that award, he probably would have taken it. And you saw the, them together. And you're like, I don't, I don't see how that works. Like, I don't see what she's seeing in him. Him. And eventually she didn't see what she saw in him either. But, I mean, that's a different, that's a different message. Uh, <laughs> and then you, you, you've met some people that, like, love somebody, and you're like, I could never love them. Like, I wonder, how in the world do they love them? Because extravagant love sees things that other people don't see. When you think about it, when God, you know you. Honestly, if you were God in heaven, would you look down and go, oh, my gosh, I love them so much. Like, I know me, I would like, I wouldn't be the, the cream of the crop. I wouldn't be the one I would pick. Like, I would definitely pick Shayla over me. But God looks down and sees things that other people can't see. And Jesus is getting to the end of his earthly ministry, and his disciples, honestly, they're consumed with themselves. They're, they're in this argument about who's going to be first and who's going to be sitting next to him and who's going to be further down the total pole. And this woman rolls into the middle of that, and she just goes for it. She goes all in, and she takes this perfume. She breaks it over his head. And in that moment, uh, the perfume and the fragrance of this perfume fills the entire room. And as this aroma fills the room, you know what else fills the room? Criticism. They thought, this woman's overdoing it. And Jesus stops them because he's like, y'all don't see what I see. And you don't see what she sees. See, this woman could have sat in the corner and just been a fly on the wall. And she could have resisted the urges to take this bold step. She could have thought to herself like, hey, if I take this step, I know people are going to be critical of me. I know people are going to talk out against me. I know what the hate that's going to come my way. But she decided that she was going to do what she could. I believe that in her heart, she knew that, she, and she said to herself, if I don't do it now, I won't ever do it. And unfortunately, we live in a day and an age where we are always Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you. Tomorrow, right? We always want, like, you know what? You know what happens if you say, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to work on my marriage. There's a good chance your marriage will end today. You know what? If you're always saying, hey, tomorrow I'll get healthy, you know what the chances are of you getting healthy? Probably never. Because we're always putting off till tomorrow, and we're not guaranteed tomorrow. All that we're guaranteed is today. And the greatest tragedy in life is when God is compelling us to do something great today, and we don't do it. Because the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity. And you know that every minute you don't, your, your window is shutting.
The world needs people who will do it now. A church that is full of good intentions never saved a single soul. My prayer is not that you will be a man of good intentions. My prayer is not that you will be a woman of good intentions. My prayer is not that you will be a student of good intentions. My prayer is that you would be a person of faith that will step out and do it now and trust God in that moment because you see things that other people don't see. And you trust a God that saw something in you that nobody else could see. And you go all in. Number three, the sacrifice of extravagant love outlives the one who sacrifices it. The sacrifice of extravagant love outlives the very one who sacrifices. I I believe we have to live and give to Jesus a sacrifice that will outlive us. That we could give and connect and live for something that is bigger than us in life. That's what extravagant love is. It's the love that the disciples lived. It's the love that... That, that Billy Graham displayed. It's the love that Mother Teresa displayed that's still outliving them today. And I believe that God created us in a way and for a cause and for something bigger that we should all be living for that will outlive us. And we've got to constantly be fighting this, this urge to make everything about me, myself, and I. And we've got to say, God, I'm going to give and live for something that is so much bigger than me. And my prayer is that we would be a church that would give our finances, our time, our talents, our tr- treasure, our, our, our ideas, our skills, our abilities to glorify him in a way that would outlive us. That it would be an aroma that would linger long beyond when we're in the room. You know what people call that? They call that legacy. And some of you have experienced that. You've had a parent or a grandparent or a teacher or a mentor or a business associate or a friend that believed in such a way or served in such a way, that lived in such a way that it's still impacting your life. And I think about that as a church. Constantly driven by like, are we living in such a way, are we creating something in such a way that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to continue long after us. I like it when Shayla wears perfume. In fact, she recently got some new perfume, and it's it's amazing. And she'll be in a room, and It's so evident that she's there. But the thing that I've realized about it is, is that a lot of times when Shayla leaves the room, her smell is still in that room. When she's gone, her presence is still being felt and impacted in that place. My prayer is that we live lives, that we would give, that we would sacrifice in such a way that when we leave the room, call this earth, that the aroma of our life would still be permeating that place. You think about Jesus in this moment. He's 48 hours from the cross, from taking all of the sin of humanity onto his shoulders. The world reeks of rejection and brokenness. And Jesus goes to the cross for all the things that we deserve. And as he's strung out on the cross, gasping for breath, (gasps) do you know what he's taking in? The sacrifice of this woman. 
I don't know if you've ever worn too much perfume or cologne. It doesn't stay with you just a day. It stays with you four days. And as he's taking his breaths, his last breaths, he's smelling the sacrifice of extravagant love that this woman gave. And what's happening simultaneously is God the Father is pouring out his greatest sacrifice, his son on the cross. And after he dies and rises to heaven, do you know what still lingers? The aroma of salvation for people to experience today. The legacy of that woman, the legacy of the cross, the extravagant love of Christ is still resonating with us today. Maybe you're here today and You've never experienced the miracle of salvation, the fact that there's a God that extravagantly loved you before you ever loved him. He doesn't ask you to love him first. He goes, man, I'm going to go first. I'm going to love you first. In the most sacrificial way possible by giving the most precious gift I have so that we could restore relationship. And maybe you're here today and you need to experience that. The extravagant love of God with every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're in here today and you say, you know what, Pastor TJ, I need that in my life today. I, 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 I've got a lot of things competing for my love, but the love that I need is the love of God. And if that's you here today with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd love to pray with you. If you just slip your hand up at the count of three, I'd love to pray. One, two, three. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'll see you back there. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Nobody else? Yes, ma'am, I see you back there. If you just pray this prayer in your heart, I see you back there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I see you guys back there. You can put your hands down. If you just pray this prayer in your heart as I pray it out loud, you say, God, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice you gave to me. The extravagant love of your son poured out on Calvary for my sins that I could never repay so that I could experience a relationship with you. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Fill my life with your extravagant love. Let it overflow from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. God, that you would move, that you would shape, that you would transform me in a way like I've never been shaped and transformed before. God, and as you pour your love out into me, God, my, my prayer is, is that my life would pour out your love to others. That I would be an aroma and a fragrance of your extravagant love for other people to experience on this earth. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Listen, if you just made a decision to follow Jesus, you just made the best decision you could ever make. Let's give it up for those people. In fact, right after this service, there's a room called The Hub. It's right across from the coffee bar. We'd ask that you take a moment and walk in there. We have some resources. We have some tools that we'd love to give you. As you begin this journey of faith, of following God, this God that extravagantly loves you, we want you